Sometimes, stranger. Hi, I'm Rob Whiten from the Innsmouth Book Club. Join me and my fellow guide, John Chadwick, as we take you on a fortnightly tour of Innsmouth. We visit places such as the Picture House, the Library and Innsmouth Museum to discuss all aspects of weird fiction, whether it be book, film, music, TV or art. As well as that, we stop over at the Gilman House to have a chat with a resident guest. That includes authors, artists, musicians, in fact, Lovecraftian creatives of all types. You can find our free shows on Patreon, and there you can also sign up as a patron, which brings you bonus content, plus a monthly PDF copy of Innsmouth News, which features articles, author spotlights, all the latest news and reviews, and more. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash Innsmouth BC. We hope to see you soon, because remember, Innsmouth isn't just a place, it's a state of mind. This episode is brought to you by Donner. Check out the show notes to find a good deal at Donner. Like the sound of this? This is the Donner Island Delay, and the really cool Donner LP that I've shown off on, like, Instagram. Check it out. Uh, They've got some really good summer deals, and check out their snap deals as well. Use the link in the show notes to help support the show. Get yourself some cool musical instruments, maybe some patch chords. Cool. This episode is brought to you by California Tea House. California Tea House is a family-owned tea store where you can find some of the world's best loose leaf tea and organic herbal tea blends. Like a fine wine, there is no comparison between fine loose leaf and common broken leaf tea bags. So, yeah, no, check them out. Check them out. They have quite a bit of pretty awesome tea collections. I'm a huge fan of their white teas. Uh, They have a tea club that you can join, but, you know, they've got green tea, black tea, white tea, oolong, that uh, robios and herbal tea. They've also got teaware. So check out California Tea House in the show notes. You're listening to KZOM, Olean Public Radio. Greetings, listeners. It is I, T.B. Spitzer, in former days, here once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits, like the dreamlands or things of a weird nature that are Lovecraftian leaning. Once more we head to those dark woods, further feeling those malevolent forces upon us. Once again we walk down the lightless stone staircase in the middle of nowhere. You're listening to KZOM. Hello everyone, it is me, D.B. Spitzer, and as always, my co-host, your buddy, David Heath. Dave, how the heck is it going, Farmer Dave? I am well, and I want to say hello to everyone, except for you that one person who's listening you know who and you know why whoa but everybody else so glad you're listening wow dave has beef with someone i've never even known that to happen all right uh yeah hey everyone it's the west coast east coast goat farmer thing oh okay okay cool 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 all right well i i know i'm not an east coast goat farmer so uh, i'm in the clear so yeah um Today we're going to be talking about some Narlethotep again, and some more character classes for uh, D&D Dungeons and or Dragons, and we've got Ken Height this week talking about Narlethotep. One of the best people to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping for next week or the week after to have Scott Glancy and some other people. We're going to have access to some uh, cool folks at the... uh, Uh, comic-con that's uh coming up in portland so we're gonna see if we can't find anyone and if we can't find anyone we know a ton of people we can talk to about narlethotep if you're one of those people and you're listening contact us at pgttcm.com or if you know me on the facebook contact me on the facebook message subject narlethotep 
for the podcast 2022 because we'll probably cover Nar Lethotep again in 2027 or 2028 so yeah so if you miss this then you won't be able to hear it again except for on reruns for five whole years yep yep and we'll get even other people to talk about Narlethotep. Heck, we might even get Narlethotep themselves. So, yeah. <laughs> so, hey, um, we're also going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons today. And uh, some of my favorite character classes. And Dave, I know there's some of yours as well. Yes, they are. So, anything fun going on up at the goat farm this week? Well... Fun is such a loaded word. Yeah. But no, it's 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 going well. We just gotta the heat's back, so we just gotta keep the goats hydrated. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just did the first week of school, so the kids are having to walk to uh two separate schools now. And you gotta uh, keep the kids hydrated. I gotta keep the kids hydrated, exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't had a chance to like goof off or do anything crazy or you know, spend time goofing around or anything because i've been busy doing kids stuff so yeah <laughs> but i did have time to talk to ken height yesterday and that will be on the podcast between uh the part where uh dave and i talk about stuff to the part where dave and i talk about stuff so let's jump what in there bookends? yeah dave we are talking about two avatars of Naralethotep, two that I feel like are a little bit more common and people run across more often, or kind of like almost like um, central base avatars that it feels like other avatars are based off of. Yes, and, and they're probably, with the exception of, you know, the Beast of the Bloody Tongue mm -hmm. and uh, Naralethotep, yeah. as himself in the prose poem, they probably are the most pop, most well-known. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, definitely within, like, gaming and such. But yeah, we have, uh, today we have the Black Man uh, from England and the Black Pharaoh from Egypt. Yes, and so when we talk about, I mean, there is absolutely an... Uh, no one denies it. There's an inherent racism in Lovecraft. Yes. But in black in this term, even though there is maybe with a color, it, it, it also is symbolic like black magic. Yeah. And, and the black man wasn't really, wasn't created by Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. You know, he puts his in Egypt, but black man is a form or in, you know, New England folklore uh -huh. is a aspect of the devil. Yeah. The aspect of the devil that approaches witches. And we kind of debated how we pronounced this before on the show, but I'm just going to say uh, Tabitha, uh -huh. who was the slave who was supposedly taught the Salem witch trial girls uh -huh. magic. They say, she said in the girls that, that, you know, the black man approached him mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. them and taught magic. Okay. So this is very much Lovecraft's version of a, a uh, of the New England devil uh -huh. uh, through the eyes of Hawthorne and Cotton Mather. Uh, and we see especially that he too is going to be this this aspect that goes to uh, to uh, witches in uh, Dreams of the Witch House. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the, the form that, that comes to uh, to uh, the witch there. Okay. All right. And when it's black, he, he is black, but not black like human being. Black like, you know, dark jade stone. Yeah. With the exception of his teeth. But everything else in his clothes, his eyes are going to be this, this dark blackness. And it is probably the most traditional uh, Judeo-Christian devil concept that we see um, Norothotep take. Yeah, yeah. 
definitely, definitely. And the Black Pharaoh is pretty much the same thing, but in Egyptian robes? Yes, and so it wasn't actually created by Lovecraft. Okay. It's going to appear first before anything else in uh, Lovecraft's um, oh, uh, The Haunter of the Dark. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's going to be created in by Robert Block. Okay. Who uh, Hunter in the Dark is is dedicated to. Okay. And so there's a throwout line which Lovecraft loved where he mentions the Haunter of the Dark. It's going to be the first time it's going to appear uh, published because in a rare situation, Lovecraft is actually going to beat Block in publication. Gotcha. Uh, so in the Haunter of the Dark, it's going to come out before the Fane of the Black Pharaoh. Sure, yeah, okay. Which, of course, you know, the Black Pharaoh is takes the, the you know, is the main baddie, is mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. antagonist. But Lovecraft learns about this through his letters from Block. Okay. And, and you know, the Hunter of the Dark, Robert Blake, gets killed. Mm-hmm. Spoiler! Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Robert Blake is based... Not on the actor who played Little Rascals, yeah. but as Robert Block. And so Lovecraft put in other, you know, tributes and tip of the hats to Block yeah. by using, you know, uh, is one of the throwaway things is um, the Black Pharaoh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, the Black Pharaoh is often referred to as Nephron Ka. All right. But there was a typo. So in some of the Chaosium stuff, mm-hmm. in the first printing, it came out as Nafru Ka. Okay. Um, and that probably literally was just a typo. I don't think yeah. Chaosium ever admitted it. But when they went on later printings, they they, they rechanged it to Nephron. And Nephron Ka was supposed to be a third dynasty pharaoh but he's also a, another nephrica yeah is associated with nitocris yeah now, nitocris who in reality probably didn't exist but she's she's a traditional egyptian legend sure was yeah. the last pharaoh of the sixth dynasty and i don't remember anything of i'm reading yeah that she ever had a child in fact that's the whole thing story uh Nitocris's storyline uh-huh. is she's getting revenge on her husband's murderers. Okay. Uh, but in several of the Mythos books, she has a child also named Nephron Ka. All right. Who might be the reincarnation or the re returning of the original Nephron Ka. Gotcha. Okay. Huh. Interesting stuff. Anything else about the Black Pharaoh we should go over, you think? Or? Well, and, and, and to some extent, I think I, I may mention this. He, of course, is going to be you know, part of the mask of uh, Narlotep. Sure. Which I'm actually a current member, so I, I try to avoid a lot of any spoilers to that game. Uh-oh, okay. <laughs> but if we're still playing it in 100 years, then I forget the spoilers, you know, today. But yeah, so... Um, I, I kind of start limiting my my research, but when it started coming up to like Chaosium or something or stuff that was written not in the '30s, I tried to uh, avoid it as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, funny thing in an interview you'll hear on this episode, uh, I I I, uh, I spill the beans and mention uh, something about Omar Shakti, and then Ken gives me grief about you know. Spilling the beans on a uh, Chaosium game from 20 years ago, <laughs> and then proceeds to spill the beans on uh, Stephen Alzis from the Delta Green campaign setting. So, oh. <laughs> so spoiler alerts, um, you know. So, 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 spoiler alert from something 2,400 years go yeah Nidacris gets revenge on the death of her husband oh geez spoiler alerts if much you read, if you haven't read the legends of Nidacris mm-hmm. in the last two eons then you know 
It's not my fault. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's also <laughs> a, a version, and I have to admit, I've only read the first. I need to, especially because of our uh, fact that we're going to be covering comics, uh, Cthulhu comics at, at sure. Comic Con. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the Black Pharaoh is also one of the forms that um, uh, Norola Tap takes in uh, the uh, series Fall of Cthulhu. Which is a, a, I think, about a hundred issue run uh, by Boom Studio. Uh -huh. It's actually a pretty decent book, uh, at least the the ones that I have read. And one of the the main versions are avatars of uh, Naruto Tip is the uh, the Black Pharaoh. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Are you there, Dave? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just trailed off there and okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the Black Pharaoh. Um let's uh let's let's meander over to the next segment and uh here's some ads and uh a little bit of Ken Height. Then probably another ad. And then me and Dave talking about rogues and let's see, rogues wizards. and wizards and warlocks and sorcerers. So that's going to be oh super my. cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in a bit, everyone. This is Dave's Corner of the Podcast. It is awesome and it's going to go fast. It's not the Indian Three, two, one, clap. <laughs> you didn't even try. No, but I'll, I'll, I'll be able to figure it out based off of the dialogue. Off of the laughter. All right. <laughs> so, Ken, how are you doing these days? I'm doing great. Uh, Chicago is as beautiful as it ever is in August. It may kiss 80 today. Nice. It's going to go down see the noir city film fest at the music box film palace gonna ride the brown line home the chicago's most noir l line it's gonna nice. be great gonna eat some empanadas very cool how could how could my day get any better i ask you i'm not sure oh and also i'm talking to db oh yeah yeah that's how great true. is that yeah you get to talk to me about uh egyptian uh folk and uh, just messenger in general, of, just any uh, Egyptian folk. We're going to talk about well, like Thutmose the Third or Anwar Sadat. Well, we really Nagi could Mahfouz. if you wanted to, but I don't think we want to. I wanted to talk to you about a messenger of the. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't even know what you classify Azathoth as anymore. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that you know, if you, if we're talking. Uh, Classifying things. There's sure. nothing wrong with outer god for Azathoth. I works for me. Works for me. Works for me. Yeah. I I don't feel like reinventing Sandy Peterson's beautiful wheel. <laughs> okay. Myself. All right. So yeah. if we're talking, I mean, especially if we're talking about the gaming uh, <laughs> version of the Mighty Messenger, the true. Crawling Chaos, true, the true. Black Pharaoh. Yes. His nibs. <laughs> So yeah, we're talking about Narlethotep today. The Ayatollah with... of Percentile Dicerola. <laughs> the rock and rolla of no. The Ayatollah of Dicerola. Or yes, did... that is exactly what I just said. Oh, okay. I'm well sorry. Done. <laughs> I, I have a habit of doing that on accident. Yeah. Uh so so Ken, uh we're talking about Narlethotep today. Uh, everyone, welcome. Ken Height. <sighs> To, to, Pause uh, for applause. Pause pe for people's guide to the Cthulhu mythos. Well, it's great to be back, DB. Thanks be for inviting me. Thanks yeah. for having me. No, I, I think the last time you were on the show, it was called something else. But yeah, no. We're... Hasn't it always been called People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos in one version or other, and then you just reclassify it at random? 
Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. It was like no. Black Books for a while or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was Black Clock Audio Tales. Black Clock Audio Tales. Something else. But it's else. always been PGCTTM. PGTTCM.com. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, it's, so it's always been at some <laughs> substrate level the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Definitely, right? definitely. Yeah, so. I, I suck at branding, but yeah. Well, I, I think you overbrand. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. many good brands, and then they fight with each other. Like, <laughs> only the strongest will win. Well, it's it's uh, Naralethotep's influence. I, I swear. That's right. To... Yes, your podcast also has a thousand <laughs> forms. So what's so the... everyone be glad that the podcast does not come in the form of a great and bloody tongue. Yeah. So uh, what's okay? So. We've talked about how awesome Chicago is and what's going on with Chicago. What's awesome about Naralethotep and how is the best way to use Naralethotep in your role-playing campaign? Well, um, the thing about Naralethotep, the way that he is portrayed, especially in Call of Cthulhu and sure. Trail of Cthulhu yeah. and other of Cthulhu's, is that he is the great old one or outer god, depending on how you categorize him, uh -huh. who actually wants to annoy people. Okay. Um, the version of him that uh, has been taken out of primarily uh, Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, but also a little bit from his own titular short story, Nir mm -hmm. is of a, uh, a, a godlike figure, a, a, a prophet, a, a wonder worker, uh, who nonetheless takes human form and uh, exists to uh, destroy humanity. Uh, that he is, he has a interest in our, and as opposed to Cthulhu, who just is going to wake up and roll over and smash us, right? Uh, there's nothing personal about it with Cthulhu. Sure, yeah. He's just a yeah. giant a super kaiju alien, uh, and when he wakes up, his unfettered telepathy will uh, smash all of mankind's uh, uh, sanity and structures, and then he'll eat us. And that's nothing personal. It's just it's just how the world is. Oh yeah. But with Neolithotep, it's the personal uh, malevolence and the personal sort of joy in tormenting uh, the in this in usually the player characters, but certainly in many cases, you know the the innocent NPC or or whoever else or mm -hmm. the city of Cairo, whoever he's going after that. Uh, gives you then a, a sort of a big bad for the campaign or a or a thing to point at or a way to make the mythos personal uh, uh, on a personal level in a way that, you know, Shubnagorith or Azathoth or, uh, uh, you know, Cthulhu is just a big ball of fire. He's not talking. Oh, um, yeah. Any of those guys, uh, uh, they don't have that. The, the, the interface for them is always their cultist, mm -hmm. always their wizard. Uh, sometimes maybe their spawn if it's Yogg-Sothoth and they have a baby with um, uh, with a, a wizard uh, uh, and so you get a, a, a Waitley situation sure. but nine times out of ten uh, even Yogg-Sothoth is a, you know, a conjury his fears somewhere and he, you know, may grant an individual sorcerer immortality as Amarat Tal, but basically he's not uh, paying a lot of attention to what's going on yeah. he's sort of and even you get the sense from Dunwich Horror that Waitley more captured Yogg-Sothoth in passing and put him into his son than that Yogg-Sothoth said, you know, you know, God style, now I'm going to incarnate a son on this planet and mm -hmm. carry out my plan for this for this world. You know, Yogg-Sothoth is is he's got other things to do. He's not Yahweh. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't care about anything. But you know, Athotep, you get the sense, yeah, he actually likes, you know, burning us little ants with his magnifying glass. That's his vibe. Yeah. And that gives you a sort of a a, a villain uh, structurally for stories or uh, campaign arcs that uh, might otherwise uh, feel the lack of that. I don't know that they do feel the lack of that. Um, I think an individual super sorcerer makes a great bad guy. But, you know, if one super sorcerer makes a great bad guy, you can't argue that the avatar of a of an outer god also doesn't make a great bad guy because he certainly does. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, no. And I I feel like 
uh, Narlethotep has the ability to not only seem like the big ultra bad, but also has the ability to shape change and just be like, oh, yeah, no, I'm just like kind of like your Omar Shakti type. I, I, I'm just like your mortal who just has like a lot of kind of like stuff or wait a minute. Is Omar Shakti? Am I spoiling stuff for people? Well, it's a little late now. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, uh, Masks of Naralethotep. Um, <laughs> uh, Omar Shakti, maybe Naralethotep. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm giving it away now. I'm ruining it for everybody. Damn it. Um, and Darth Vader is also Luke Skywalker's father. Right, and Rosebud was the slide of some kind, as I understand it. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, no, no. One thing that's great about uh, Narlethotep is he can not only be a cosmic bad, he can be a local bad. Uh, not only can Narlethotep be like some sort of uh, massive tongue, but Narlethotep can also be... Uh, the leader of the underworld that you're dealing with. But... Yeah, in, in his uh, incarnation as uh, Stephen Alzis in Delta Green cosmology, he yes. runs the uh, occult mafia in New York City for some reason. Mm -hmm. And what that reason is, we don't know. And the, yeah. and, uh, the Delta Green uh, universe, there's a little bit of a of a fast shuffle. Does Alzus understand that he's Nilothotep? Is he uh, an avatar who's seeking reunion with his godhead? Sure. You know, what's Alzus's, you know, nature is left unexplained because that makes it a more powerful mystery and it makes it more fun uh, to in incorporate him into the uh, Delta Green campaign. Uh, because if he was straight up, honestly, yes, he's Nilothotep, then he'd just be able to blast everybody and that yeah, wouldn't be any yeah, fun. That yeah. wouldn't be a challenge. Um, the, yeah, I think you, you touched on something. You said that Neurothotep is a shapeshifter mm -hmm. because what that also means is that, uh, people from the very beginning, from the earliest days of Call of Cthulhu had kind of permission mm -hmm. to make Neurothotep any kind of a thing that they wanted. Sure. And after masks, certainly where we see, oh, in, in Africa, he's the, uh, the, the great wind and it comes in the form of a devil bat and mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, another place, he's the uh, dweller in the darkness with his great tripod feet. And in another place, he's the bloated woman in China. Yeah. And he takes all of these different forms. And so you can have localized cults mm -hmm. of Nirothotep that have local flavor in a way that it's hard to say, we're the cult of Cthulhu and we live in Colorado. Yeah. And it's like, well, we're kind of short of oceans here, guys. <laughs> aren't you all, aren't your gills going to get all powdery with sand? Um, and, and so Nerothotep becomes more of a universal joint because sure, sure his form in, in Colorado is maybe as a, a great and skeletal bison or something, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. his form, you know, elsewhere is going to be something else that, uh, is terrifying and weird and, uh, fits with the, with the locality. Yeah. And so that makes him a little more of a utility infielder than other gods that are kind of one note. And again, not to keep picking on Durleth, but Cthuga, you know. The, the number of things you can do with a giant ball of fire from Fomalhaut is yeah. two. It's yeah. two things. You can summon him to fight a different god, uh -huh. or uh -huh. you can set fires. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's all. Here, we're done with Cthulhu. <laughs> and, you know, when I was doing Trail and I was trying to come up with new, <coughs> with new readings for all of these gods, mm -hmm. you know, Nerlathotep is, is almost got an embarrassment of riches. Yes. Um, uh, whereas... You have to work a little bit harder to come up with readings for, you know, some of these other guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and it's it's like sometimes I wonder, why why is it called Call of Cthulhu when it could be called Naralethotep? <laughs> well, that is a sandy question. Um, I know. <laughs> it began... Um, it, it began as a as a proposal for a RuneQuest uh, Dreamland supplement, so I yeah, guess it could yeah. have been called DreamQuest. Sure, in yeah. The, in the old days, right? Which still would have had a lot of Naralethotep. <laughs> yep, absolutely, because he's everywhere. Exactly. Everywhere you want to be. Yeah, no, you could have uh, an avatar of Naralethotep for your D&D campaign, which I've done before, which is like a Aboleth that is like 
abnormally larger and darker and has more eyes or something like that or an abolesce that has no face and just stars or something you know yeah i think that uh if i were doing a DD campaign with near Authotep, i would be very tempted um in the same way that near Authotep is the embodiment of lore and wisdom that you don't want I would make him the embodiment of the psionics. Oh, yeah. Rules. And so I would have the mind flayers be the cult that is closest to Nirat, even though they have Cthulhu faces. Yeah. I feel like they might fear Cthulhu because he's madness mm-hmm. and would, you know, destroy them as he would destroy anybody. And so they would placate Cthulhu. Yeah. But they worship Nirlathotep and he would take the form of a giant. Uh, he could be an abolath or he could just be a giant um, uh, purple uh, illithid. Yeah. And... Uh, because Nirathotep, of course, is about, the, he's the messenger. And mm-hmm. what is that? That's telepathy. That, yeah. That's literally a Brian Lumley idea from uh, <laughs> Burrowers Beneath, I believe, where he sure. says, oh, no, what was called Nirathotep is is just the word telepathy, but jumbled around. And uh, no one raises their hand and says, that makes no sense, Professor, because it's a Lumley book. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the notion of Nirathotep is sort of the incarnation of telepathy. Yeah. Therefore, you know, everyone else is using the perfectly nice rules for D&D. And then along comes this, literally aberrant figure that is the psionics rules. And it's like, Oh, nope, you didn't buy tire tower of iron will smote. <laughs> um, too bad. And that sort of, um, and then learning psionics becomes a version of learning the mythos and that you yeah. are, you know, degrading your effectiveness as a regular character because you're taking this ability that can only be used in, uh, dealing with, you know, illithids or other psionic monsters or uh, near Othotep. And I think that'd be fun yeah. in D&D because if, if he's just another big beholder or another black dragon or something, again, uh, I'm not going to say that isn't fun. You, you know, you've dug your way to the bottom of the pyramid and there's a black dragon and you're like, okay, we can take him. And he opens his third eye, his three lobe burning eye. And he says, I am near Lothotep. Welcome to hell and sets you on fire. And you're yeah. like, how did that happen? He's supposed to blow acid at us. <laughs> do over, do over, do over. Um, but uh, I feel like for the, uh, for near Lothotep and by extension, the rest of the mythos to work in a D and D setting, it has to feel like it legitimately comes from outside that it's, it's not just an embodiment of chaos, yeah. right? That it's not part of the cosmology at all, that, you know, clerics can't do anything to him, that, uh, you know, every other arrow misses him because he's not in your universe at the same time, something like that. Yeah. You know, really play it up. Like, I mean, I would say um, as much fun as we all had with the old uh, Cthulhu mythos, uh, you know, uh, in Deities and Demigods, mm-hmm. just treating Nirathotep as... Uh, a kind of a, you know, what is he, a 13th level magic user, basically? Yeah, you can't see me shrug. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, <laughs> you know, again, uh, you know, I'm not saying that that's a walkover, but yeah. it's it, it, it sort of cheapens oh. Nirlathotep. And maybe the fun thing to do is have the deities and demigods write up of Nirlathotep as an avatar of Nirlathotep. Oh, sure. Yeah, and definitely. That's the version of him that exists in D&D world. And when they kill him, they're like, oh, thank God we've killed Nirlathotep. And then from the, you know, the edges of the of the universe begin to tear apart. And now real Nirlathotep comes through um, <laughs> to, to claim the body, at least. And bad stuff starts cooking off that all of their D&D rules just don't apply to. Oh, definitely, definitely. Now, I was thinking, like, you could almost, like, do kind of a, uh, uh, a this is so non-Narlethotep, but, like, you could almost have a template for Narlethotep for, like, other creatures, even though it's just so not Narlethotep. But... Well, that would basically be your, um, you know, sort of your <laughs> amped up version of, what do they call them, what, the, the outsiders, the aberrations, the yes. things that, yeah. that don't exist. Yeah, but if, if, if like, you... I, I don't know, but uh, it's 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 just like it's like sphinxes. There's there's so many avatars of Narlethotep that are sphinxes. It's like mm-hmm. there's got to be some sort of like Narleth. I mean, like an Azathothian strain of the sphinxes or something. <laughs> I mean, I'm absolutely on team. Make sphinxes scary again. Oh like, yeah, I think that that's uh, that's that's true to everything about them. I mean. There's a reason that, you know, Oedipus became king after he killed the Sphinx. Sure. Despite his unorthodox home life. Um, 
So I, I, I feel like, yeah, I'm, uh, a, near, a specifically near Lothotepist template, sure. I think that would work in a campaign where you, again, maybe had, you know, a Nerlothotep and a Cthulhu that are both forces mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. the outside. And oh, yeah. One does one thing and Nerlothotep is another. If yeah. you've got a bunch of gods, then probably it's simpler to do one mythos template and then yeah. your uh, Nerlothotep uh, flavored ones can summon, um, you know, hunting horrors or something. Oh, and yeah. that that's their... Uh, that's the signal that, oh, no, these are in league with that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and I was just thinking about, like, or in the past I've thought about, like, what about if you, like, put, like, some sort of, like, template of Narlethotep. This is this is an idea I've had for a while, of putting a template of Narlethotep over, like, a black dragon and then having, like, kobold cultists of Narlethotep. You know, maybe monks or something like that. Give Give the players something different to deal with, but... <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, it, it, it's all kind of depending on what your campaign is like and what yeah. your campaign has been like. Um, I, I assume that there's some number of people who play D&D &D specifically so that they don't have to deal with anything yeah. uh, threatening or outside the rules, and mm -hmm. that would sort of violate the spirit of your table. But <laughs> if they're playing D&D &D because they literally don't know other games exist or because this is the only one everyone agrees on, then absolutely I would say, you know, uh, put as much variant... Uh, weirdness and spin into your D and D campaign as you as your table can stand. Oh, that's and, that's that's kind of like the house rules for me and Dave is put as much Call of Cthulhu as 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 much of the mythos into your D and D as people can stand. Yep. Well, and, and now that uh, Sandy's got that big book of um, uh, uh, Cthulhu monsters for Pathfinder, you're oh, yeah. basically halfway there, right? I'm halfway there, living on a prayer. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> A prayer to near Othotep, perhaps. Dun, dun, dun. Possibly, yeah. So, Ken, um, any other tips you have on using Narlethotep as a D and D deity, D and D demigod? I mean, like, what kind of domain does Narlethotep have if you're playing D and D, like a Pathfinder kind of thing? Do you go out to the far realm? Does Narlethotep have an office in Sigil? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, part of the Narlethotepness of Narlethotep is that he's everywhere, right? Sure. That he has a thousand forms. So yeah, there's a version of him that's in Sigil. There's a version of him that's you know in a demi plane somewhere near Ravenloft. You know, uh -huh. the sort of the creepiest worst uh tunnels underneath Ravenloft or lead you to Nerlathotep's realm sure. or um uh, that he's in you know uh he could be in any of them I mean he's in the dream quest which is straight up fantasy world yeah uh, he just yeah lives on a mountain surrounded by Shantax so sure why not he's on okay. a mountain surrounded by Shantax <laughs> off in the northwest <laughs> corner of your world or wherever or your, your Egypt parallel if you've got sort of a Greyhawk situation you've got a desert with a bunch of sphinxes and pyramids anyway yeah. You know, Bop Nirlathotep in there in, in a whole different form as, as your Nirlathotep, the Sphinx, if you like. The Abu Hall, the father of terror, that uh, was the original name for the Sphinx uh, yeah. in Arabic when the Arabs conquered the place. So, okay. Um, I mean, I would I would say, you know, once you've put him in, um, unless it's the climax of the campaign and it's meant to destroy the whole campaign, uh -huh. I would have him, you know, in ev every plane, every potential campaign realm, you know, you try and get in Spelljammer and you sail out to a planet. Oh, welcome. Welcome to the uh, uh, planet of the seven stars where Nathotep lives and he's surrounded by Migo now who worship him. Oh. You know, I, I think that um, uh, there's uh, a lot of, um, of, of possibilities with that. But again, this implies a sort of an epic D and D campaign where the characters are bipping around. Yeah. And the trouble with that is, once you're at that level of epicness, the characters become so powerful that it's very, very hard to threaten them. And in many ways, introducing Nerlathotep, especially the way we've been talking about, that he violates the rules of D&D &D or he uses the rules that waste everyone's valuable time, um, that that might implicitly break your table contract. Because yeah. you, you, I didn't spend all this time getting to 13th level to be slapped around by some sphinx, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. That's not That's not my situation. And so... This is again a little bit of a dance with your with your own player group, and everyone's going to be different. But uh, if if I were introducing Nirlathotep, uh, it would be 
to be a legitimate threat and okay. a legitimate threat, not just to the players, but to the campaign world. And yeah. it's no, it's very much. That's the reason that he is violating rules. That's the reason spells don't work on him or turn back around or whatever your new Lothotep template is um, because he's a threat. And that, you know, hopefully refocuses their mind that there are things that, you know, no matter how plus five your sword is, you need a different situation, a different set of solutions. Oh, sure. Uh, to yeah. Deal with this. Yeah. Oh, def- definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and I, I have kind of one final question. That's kind of like, I don't know for my gaming, uh, campaigns, um, specifically just, just a curiosity. How would you deal with Narlethotep in a bronze age collapse versus like Narlethotep in like, say a 30 years war situation? I mean, the thing about Narlethotep is that he's always projecting, predicting, ushering in the apocalypse. That's okay. his vibe. Sure. So the Thirty Years' War, to some extent, uh, him being the Black Man of the Witches works perfectly. Oh, nice! Because that's your classic witch cult. Yeah. Um, you've got you know there you know your Lovecraftian witch cult is is burgeoning everywhere. This is historically when the last big wave of witch prosecutions happens across Europe. Sure. And so Nero Lethertep is the Black Man, um, who is simultaneously perhaps a, a Black Cardinal advising. Uh, uh, Richelieu Mm -hmm. and a black uh, 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 Jesuit at the Imperial Court and a black uh, Puritan uh, in Sweden. And so he's driving these armies just to desolate Germany. And he's sort of encouraging all of this uh, slaughter and uh, madness uh, in the name of Christianity, both A, to build up a big pile of human corpses for his ghoul buddies or whatever other reason, um, some kind of necromancy situation. And uh, B, you could say uh, he wants to specifically undermine Christianity and what better way than to cause the Thirty Years' War. Now, the downside to that sort of treatment is you take human agency away from the actual Richelieu, the actual emperor, sure, and the yeah. actual uh, uh, king, uh, queen of Sweden, <laughs> who did all this on purpose themselves. <laughs> yeah. And you can't be saying, you know, uh, oh, no, it's near Lothotep's fault the Thirty Years' War happened. Yeah. I think what you have is, you would rather have is a situation where, as they are prosecuting the Thirty Years' War, they find themselves turning more and more to near Gotcha. Right? It's not that near Lothotep is, is uh, the person who corrupted Richelieu. It's that Richelieu <laughs> is already such a snake and a weasel that he's turning to every single thing that could give him an advantage, no matter how amoral or blasphemous. And that's how he stumbles on you know, the black book. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and that might even be his form in, in the campaign is, is not as an, as a being, although he'd be a being stalking the, the battlefields mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and hanging out with witches, sure. but uh, he might just be a black book. And uh, in Sweden and in Paris and in Vienna, they're all looking at the same black book and uh, learning the same horrible near uh, uh, uh operations. Ooh. Uh, whereas in the, I mean, the bronze age collapse, you're, Again, you're in a situation where you're during an apocalypse. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you could keep him as out of Egypt. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. he could take, you know, good old Anubis. I mean, what's what's better? Or Set. Sure. I think Set is almost canonically a version of Nerlathotep as it is. Um, he could be a, a darkly aspected Thoth. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be a sort of a Lovecraftian situation where all the Egyptian gods are just fingers of the great paw that is Nerlathotep. So yeah. okay. there's a dark Thoth, a dark Ptah. Even a dark Ra, a black sun, if you will, that is, um, uh, you know, the the incarnation of uh, Nirlathotep, and that you know he is uh, bringing the uh, the sea peoples down as uh, just one of the things that's happening in the collapse, and he's just sitting there in his pyramid laughing. Yeah. Um, and his mortal form is just this guy Nefren Ka mm-hmm, who just mm-hmm. wanders around, and everyone says Nefren Ka, that name seems weirdly familiar. And he's like, <laughs> Well, you didn't read it on any monuments, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> But he's just going around and, and being a helpful wizard. And, you know, he's there with Ramses when he fights off the peoples of the sea. And so he gets more and more power and more and more influence. Gotcha. Or if your campaign's actually in the Levant, mm-hmm. um, maybe the Lathotep is, is more um, uh, worshipped by the uh, by the sea peoples as some, you know, combination of, you know, Hades and Zeus, right? That he's, oh, cool. you know, this yeah. uh, dark... 
uh, chthonic figure, but that he um, can uh, command these black uh, uh, eagles that that shoot thunderbolts or or whatever. That that's their version of the haunting horrors, and so uh, that he would be sort of this feared aspect of the lives of the sea peoples. That you know maybe they're you know they love the loot, they love the knocking over cities, and uh, it could be individual cults of Nerothotep in all these cities that caused all the earthquakes that uh, historically happened at about that time. But um, I think part of the fun of setting Nerothotep in in the Bronze Age would uh-huh. be tying him into actual uh, a Bronze Age cults and Bronze Age religions. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Saying, because... You know, no one gets mad at you if you're like, oh, Hades was secretly near Akhetep. There's not like a <laughs> bunch of Hades worshippers, you know, saying, dang, dang, and how dare you? How dare you talk right. about, yeah. Why, why? Whereas if you, you know, say near Akhetep is the black Bible that's used by Richard, you might get a little pushback. Yeah, on. yeah. Uh, near Akhetep is ball, and then people are like, uh, I still... Yeah, no, that's still a religion, dudes. <laughs> yeah. But he's, but, you know, it's a religion you can pick on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh I feel like uh, it's more fun to sort of play a little bit against type. I mean, oh, if, sure. if your characters are all Yahvists, you know, uh, worshippers of Yahweh, uh, uh, Hebrews using this as the chance to escape uh, Egypt and flee into Canaan. Um, yeah. I don't know that making Nerothotep ball is as cool as making Nerothotep the golden calf. Sure, definitely, right? definitely. Or as something that they're actually, I mean, they were tempted historically by ball. That's why the whole book of Kings is about stopping ball worship. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, again, dig a little deeper. Find another uh, Canaanite god that you can make Nerothotep or you can pretend was Nerothotep. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, I had recently Dave and I talked about using Narlathotep with uh, the Isle of Crete because uh, using the Avatar of the Black Bull on mm. Crete as kind of like a uh, secondary religion or something like that with the Minoans or yeah, just I like the idea of the the labyrinth as a a big elder sign or a sign of Koth that was built by Daedalus to hold this incarnation of Nerlathotep. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and that Pasiphae was actually the Lavinia Whateley of the Bronze Age and gave birth to a, a half Nerlathotep uh, baby who was in the form of this uh, minotaur. Definitely. And that's why uh, uh, Daedalus notices and he says, we need to put him in the sign of Koth pronto and builds a giant uh, three-dimensional structure of the sign of Koth to trap him in. I, I think that's kind of cool. That is very cool. And I, I am really starting to feel, not I'm really starting to feel, I felt since the age of 10 that uh, history, geography, and cartography are the three greatest tools for becoming a good DM. Maybe take some improv classes and learn how to talk to people. But it's, yeah, no, it's it's like that kind of stuff is like so awesome for creating backstories and understanding the history of things to like put fictional things into and i think you do an amazing job at that ken well that's um, that's basically been my my shtick yeah and no definitely to, to, to my way of thinking <laughs> it's so much easier to do a little bit of research and come up with something that's already got all these hooks and meanings and uh, and elements and, and flavors attached to it in people's minds. Yeah. And it is to make something up that will have that many hooks yeah. and flavors. I mean, by saying, you know, Anubis, I have just hijacked, you know, a millennia of theology and myth and weird stuff. Oh, yeah. That yeah. I would never be able to make up if I'd made up some other, uh, you know, oh, no, he's the god... Ladge call, and <laughs> he's like a big animal of the desert. Oh, I'm already lost. Yeah, no, no. And you can just say like Rosicrucians, and then like build exactly. off of and that. You've got, or... And you've got a vibe. I mean, it's kind of a lame vibe because they're Rosicrucians, but still. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, every occult <laughs> campaign needs the simple-minded people who who de- dig too deep. And Definitely. That's the Rosicrucians. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Ken, it has been so amazing to have you back on the show. We have to do this uh, very soon. Uh, super I've ex- always been on Team Ken B on the show. Yeah, you no, uh, I'm super excited to see you in October at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. I am likewise excited to both be seen and to see you. Dee Dee. Yeah, yeah. Um, if for some reason you're going to uh, Rose City Comic Con in September, I'll see you there. But I, I doubt. I, I find it <laughs> remarkably unlikely. That I'll me be too. There. Me too. Uh, yeah, no, it's just a comic book convention, so I seriously doubted you would be for that. But yeah, my, no. My, my big September plan is to go to Mothman Days Ooh. in uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Wow. Okay. Cool. Say hi to uh, Moth Boys for me. I will. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, Ken, thank you again so much. Uh, high fives and uh, we'll have you again on soon anything you have to plug any projects you have coming up Um, I think I can plug Second Inquisition which is my newest uh, book for Vampire the Masquerade I love that wrote some of it for Renegade yeah Um, so check that out everybody Uh, and um, dropping at some point though probably well after this podcast drops Uh, are another uh. two vampire books Vampire player's guide and blood sigils which is about the blood magic scene in your vampire city that you didn't even know was there but it was whoa one of these days i'll have to have you explain to me what the hell vampire is so well um uh, no time like the present i think you're old enough your mother and i agree okay good good all right ken well we'll talk to you later and have yourself a good one all right man take care all right hey everyone it's me db new sponsor on the show clary Glary offers a great price and better quality goods and services for music lovers. Are you looking for good prices, free shipping, 100% quality guarantee? Glary's got you covered. Guitars, bass guitars, mandolins, they've got saxophones, trumpets, drums, they've got guitar cases, amplifiers, all the stuff that you need without having to break the bank. Inexpensive doesn't have to mean cheap. Check out the show notes to find more about Glary. 20 watt amplifiers for under $50. Hard cases for your electric guitar for under $80. Guitars themselves for under $90. Come on, folks, check out the show notes. Get a Glary. Prepare for a spine tingling, nerve shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classics and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic monsters, modern talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. t-shirts in the shop just go to pgttcm.com check out all of our cool t-shirts and stickers heck we even got some shelf curtains in there keep clean look cool have cool stickers to put on stuff join us on patreon and get a free sticker So I was saying the other day, thieves can't, but rogues can. <laughs> hey everyone, it's D&D on d and I'm D, and here's the other D, Dave. Uh, I'm DB Spitzer, uh, show's creator and co-host. And uh, this week we're talking about rogues, sorcerers, Warlocks and wizards, zerds, zerds. So yeah, um, just like we did last week, we're gonna basically talk about the cool stuff they get and uh, the cool stuff you can do with a rogue. Which I don't know. I mean, rogue isn't quite the Swiss Army knife 
of uh, PCs, but heck, they're 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 pretty darn good. <laughs> it's it's always good to have at least one rogue in your party. Yeah, and if for no other traps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. For no other reason, you you you've got traps. So I would say they're almost. I mean, you can work around it, and I think the rules are a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, more softer towards other people finding traps, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I would say that it's probably if the only one I would say might be more important to have a rogue is to have a healer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Rogues are a little bit more important. I, you know what? I think both problems can be solved with a potion. <laughs> well, that that is true. That that is true. Uh, you don't need a cleric if you have unlimited supply of healing potions. Or trap-finding potions or goggles of sight, true sight. I don't know. I, I can't remember. <laughs> and, and rogues, of course, were originally called thieves. Yeah. In the original, they were, they were thieves. And, and I've always got the impression that, and there were obviously a lot of thieve characters. Mm -hmm. Um, Grey Mauser, yeah, uh, Clark Ash and Smith's characters. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I always got the impression that they were really thinking of Bilbo and Frodo when they made this this class. Yeah, and now they they did read a lot more fantasy. Um, Gygax at all read a lot more fantasy than I did, so they sure, had probably sure. a lot more yeah. experience fantasy thieves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but I always, when I was younger, I thought that they were basically basing this on on Frodo and Bilbo. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's uh, a thief in uh, Clark Ashton Smith stories that I I, I think could definitely uh, fit in with this kind of like your your medium fighter who has skills. You know, they use light light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, short swords. They're not as powerful as a fighter. They only get one d eight per level. And uh, which is an increase for a long time. It was one d six. Yeah, yeah, that's so nice. And uh, for skills, you get to choose four four skills: acrobats, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. So that's a lot of sneaky kind of things. Yeah, things you want uh, dexterity or charisma or uh, an intelligence. I think for. Uh... Investigation, or is that a wisdom? Uh, I will have to look that up for you. Well, but um, I think that is an intelligence, but uh, we will double check that. All right. Now, I think that... So, weapon finesse was a big game changer for rogues, but I think 5e... Rapier. Rapier is like the Heimar missile... Gotcha. Of, uh, of D and D. I mean, it just changes everything, and it makes. And now I wouldn't say rogues are front line, but it makes them a lot more combat. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, your rogues are front line is in the way of like they're snuck up behind the other people who you're mm -hmm. opposed to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was always been one of their 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 big things was was the backstabbing. Yeah. So, but uh, uh, I think that the, with rapiers now that they are much more combatant. All right. Oh yeah, intelligence is uh, what investigations tied to. Yes. So yeah. Yeah, and rogues, you know, it's 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 light armor proficiency and. It's nice to have light armor. It, you know, otherwise you have uh, dex uh, negatives to your tumbling and such uh, acrobatics, climbing uh, and yeah, yeah, and, and uh, stealth, stealth definitely. Uh, climbing, stealth, that kind of stuff is kind of part and parcel with uh, being a rogue. Something else that is part and parcel besides uh, being able to do a sneak attack, which gains as you gain in level it's uh, i believe a 1d6 and it goes up uh 1d6 yeah um 
and there's so many rules for sneak attack. Uh, you get it. We're not going to go into it too much. Uh, I have so, to have it. So now it's more if it, it's if your flank. Now it's more of a flank attack. It's the way the most of GMs that are DMs that I've played yeah. with recently consider it a, more of a, like a, a flanking maneuver. Mm -hmm. Bonus. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, which also means you get advantage and your bonus. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you also get thieves cant, which I made a joke about in the beginning, which is a mix of jargon, code, and dialect that you know allows you to speak encoded messages right out in the open. Um, I've always included like hand signals, and uh, you know, in future games, uh, you can use emojis. <laughs> yeah, or, or I think uh, I often use things like, uh, you know, the what they used to call the hobo code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where you know you could thieves can write down things on the wall so that you can see, you know, if it's dangerous or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figure that's kind of more of like a, a written element of the thieves camp, but yeah, definitely something like that could be. Uh, starting at second level, you get. Uh, cunning action, your quick thinking allows you to move and act more quickly. You can take a bonus action on your turns in combat. This action can be used only to take dash, disengage, or hide. So, yeah. Any thoughts on cunning action, Dave? No, but I got one last thing on, on, on uh, these camps. Oh, go for it. Is one of the early, probably like 60 to 80 issue of Dragon Magazine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. came with a a uh, thieves camp dictionary. Oh wow! Yeah, and you like supposed to cut it out and like fold it over. It was supposed to look like it. I, don't, I didn't cut it out of mine, yeah, but yeah. but yeah, someone wrote out this whole thieves camp you know, with pronunciation <laughs> guides and everything. <laughs> and and that's I funny. think that sort of defeats it because if 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 you've got a book that can get cat caught by yeah. the town guard, oh yeah, then why have the language? Or get reproduced by the wrong people. It's like high society types are like, oh, look at this. I know how to speak. Thieves can't chummer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, after cunning action, uh, there's archetypes that you get at third level, which kind of like expand upon what kind of rogue you are. Uh, you get cool advantages and uh, rogue abilities starting at 3rd, uh, 9th, 13th, and 17th level. And, yeah. Of course, there is uh, ability improvements at 4th, 8th, 10th, 12th, 16th, 19th level where you can bump up your scores by 2 or choose 2 ability scores by 1. Um, and also, some people uh, say, hey, you can take a feat, I believe, but yeah. Yeah, instead of uh, the bonus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a couple of um, tradition, more 3.5, that they were their own classes that are yeah. now uh, archetypes. Oh, that's cool, that's cool. Uh, and so, one is the Soul Knife, uh -huh, uh -huh. which is basically a psionicist. Yeah. Uh, and Scout. And Scout's sort of a hunter, more of a hunter ranger. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, if you want to be a Scout, you don't, I mean, I guess you could have a class as a, a ranger, but you, yeah, go through, go through um, rogues. Okay, all right. Uh, and the other one, the one that I've always kind of liked uh, is the Inquisitive, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which is basically Sherlock Holmes. Okay. Yeah, I, I generally, if I'm going to play a rogue, I'm going to play a dungeon delving, like someone who specializes in, like, finding traps, climbing up stuff, um, you know, someone who's in a thieves guild, someone who's, like, your atypical rogue, someone who's, like, I don't mind being called a thief. <laughs> and, and you got to decide if it's worth it. Yeah. But, um... Especially if you maybe are an elf or a tiefling yeah. who gets some innate magic, is mm -hmm. a arcane trickster. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. But you're going to be definitely very limited on spells. Sure, sure, yeah, no, that's one thing. Uh, something that becomes, uh, I believe, uh, I can't remember if it is, I don't think it is... 
doesn't look like it's part of the uh the 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 class anymore but uh are are, are rogues able to use magical items as easily so i don't i think this so originally yes now in 5e i don't think there's other than maybe there's one specifically developer that are more of a bonus to yeah. a, a rogue. But originally, uh, rogues were one of the few people who could read spells yeah. if they had scrolls. Sure, yeah. Uh, and detect, sort of a, understand magic. But I'm pretty sure that's pretty much disappeared by third. Yeah, all right. I always thought it was neat to be able to use rods and wands as like a... 12th level, you know, being a 12th level rogue and being like, oh, I found a magical item. I might be able to figure out what this is and I might be able to use it. You know, it's like, oh, the wizards couldn't do it in your group, you know. And and the cleric gave it a try. Uh, well, I guess it's up to the bard and the rogue to try, so. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, other things that are really cool that a rogue gets starting at fifth level, uh, when the attacker, uh, when an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you, and that's called uncanny dodge. And then at seventh level, you get something like it called evasion, where you can nimbly dodge out of the way of certain area effects, such as a dragon's fiery breath or an ice storm spell. Uh, when okay. you're yeah. yeah, now that's been moved up much higher low. I think originally it was like second or third. Oh, yeah, level. yeah. It used to be like, I think, second or third or fourth or something. Yeah, but yeah, it has moved quite a way up, but I feel like it's 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 nicer. <laughs> uh, instead of taking damage if you succeed a savings throw and only half damage if you fail, but evasion, you can't evade the vacuum of space. Or yeah. you can't evade... You know, if, if you're, like, falling into lava, you can't, like, dodge to roll out of falling out of, like, the center of a volcano with, like, you know, vol yeah, lava for, like, 500 yards around you, you know? That doesn't yeah, work. You can dodge alchemy fire. <laughs> yeah, you can dodge alchemy fire. You can evade that kind of stuff. No problem. Yeah, no, no. It's uh, Think of it more of as stuff coming at you, you not going at stuff. And um, I, I, I think you have to use awareness to, like evade quicksand so <laughs> yeah, and, and, and i do think and i'm not sure if, um, i haven't read the, enough of the 5e rules but i think you have to i i don't even think though you have to know it's coming yeah you just would make the save throw i don't think you i don't think you can be blindsided it's just automatic if you get a saving throw oh yeah it's it's you know one of those things that just shows how like the talent of a rogue they can just be like oh I just noticed that spidey senses are tingling. But yeah, at 11th level, you've refined your chosen skills until they approach perfection. Whenever you make an ability check, this lets you add your proficiency bonus. You can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. So that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. um, that's, that's just one of those things. I, I feel like there's... Uh, like a few feats you could take, like if you took jack of all trades and combined it with that, that and then you know that'd be pretty nice. <laughs> um, starting at level fourteen, you are able to hear and you are aware of location of any hidden or invisible creature within ten feet of you, in a little thing called blind sense. I always wanted uh, blind sense to be more like, oh yeah, you can fight with a blindfold now, but it's not. <laughs> it doesn't mean you can fight in a room that is... Uh... Well, actually, I guess it does mean that you can fight in a room where the lights are out. Um, since you can yeah, we always play the, you could be in darkness. hidden or invisible creature, since technically they're hidden because the room's dark. I mean, hey, blind sense, that's not too bad. I mean, you're not Matt Murdock, but hey, who is these days? Slipper. What's that? Charlie Cox. Oh, okay. Slipper. The was playing Matt Murdock. Oh. Okay. I wonder if Ben Affleck has his, his Daredevil costume still. Uh, he painted it black to make it his Batman costume. Okay. Uh, by fifth level, you should have acquired greater mental strength. Uh, you gain proficiency in wisdom savings throws. I feel like there's more to Slippery Mind than you gain proficiency in wisdom saving throws. It, it, 
you know, it, it should be like, you have a harder time being attacked by psionics or something like that. But I mean, granted, that's what wisdom saving throws are is it's, it's harder for people to mess with your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Elusive. Beginning at 18th level, you are so, or, uh, uh yeah, elusive. of it. Uh, you are so evasive that attackers rarely gain the upper hand against you. No attack roll has advantage against you while you are not incapacitated. And finally... Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty good. And, uh, finally at 20th level, you get Stroke of Luck. At 20th level, you have an uncanny knack for succeeding when you need to. If you... If you're, uh... Attack misses a target within range, you can turn the miss into a hit. Alternatively, if you fail an ability check, you can re you can re-roll that D20 roll as a 20. So when you're 20th level as a rogue, you just don't need to carry dice with you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um that's 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 rogue. Anything else about rogues you want to say there, Dave? Besides the fact that they're pretty awesome. Yeah, and the, but they, I mean, and there is a thief as well as an assassin archetype. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and assassins at one time were a separate class up until I think third, maybe second. But it does not have to, like I said, you could use the rogue to do a Sherlock Holmes character. Sure, sure, yeah. It does yeah, not yeah. have to be your, your traditional thief or assassin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Investigator types very, very quickly, yeah. And as... A rogue gets higher in level, it's more likely that they're going to turn into that kind of, like, mastermind thinker, someone who can outthink other thieves and stuff like that, and be able to be like, oh, I know this trick, I know what this trap is, you know, it's, I don't know, it's it's something that's kind of neat, it's, it's like, you get to a certain level, and then you you are your own worst enemy, or your enemy's worst enemy, if they're like you, so... <laughs> Okay. Hey, let's move on to sorcerers before I say the same thing over and over again too many times. Sorcerers. So, sorcerers, um, they, uh, what, you want to tell me about sorcerers, Dave? You love yeah, them. Sorcerers are more of an innate magic. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and I'm not, like I said, I kind of skipped second. I went kind of right into A and three. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so I'm not really sure if they appeared at second, but the, basically it was an attempt to sort of separate people who had innate abilities of magic yeah. over the people who have spent all this time studying, like sure. the John D. type wizards. Yeah. So um, now that they have different sources, or at least in five, I don't think they really cover that much in three. I think <clears> it's just maybe feats. Uh-huh. But you have either because of draconic blood uh, or uh, some sort of bloodline or wild magic. But there, you've got more flexibility on your spells, but what you don't have is as many spells, and you don't get the big ones as fast. Huh, okay. Yeah, 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 no, it's 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 kind of limited in some ways, but, yeah, I mean, you, you get to cast a lot more, and it's, it's not too bad, it's not too bad. Um, and... and... It is less number crunchy yeah, than the yeah. wizards. Yeah, it's kind uh, of like Liz, uh, wizard light in some yes. ways. So it's a good it's a good starting. Oh, that yeah. character really wants to be, uh, and we're going a little bit into warlocks, but yep. if you want a character who really wants to be a magic character, but is just learning. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Definitely, yeah. <sighs> yeah, um... That's one thing that I can say about uh, sorcerers. Sorcerers are great for your beginners. And um, also, it's it's like uh, armor. They're not allowed to use armor, which is also kind of not that great because they only get six hit dice. <clears throat> they get a 1d6 hit dice. Um, and they don't get armor. But they do get daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, light crossbow, and some pretty basic magic. But hey, it, it grows and it grows. Uh, let's see. And, and it's better than the original magic user. We get knife, you know, dagger, 
quarter staff. Uh, and quarter staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you get to choose two from Arcana, Deception, Insight, Intimidation, Persuasion, and Religion. Um, yeah, uh, Spellcasting. Uh, first level, you get cantrips uh, from the Sorcerer's Spell list, which, you know, is, is pretty... It's it's not, like, the hugest spell list, but, like, for your cantrips, you get Acid Splash, Chill Touch, Dancing Lights, Fire Bolt, Light, Mage Hand, Mending, Message, Minor Illusion, Poison Spray, Prestidigitation, Ray of Frost, Shocking Grasp, and True Strike. Uh, the, uh, you, I think you get to, what, choose four of those? That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, four cantrips. And you can figure out if you want to use them, like, oh, I'll have this one for defensive, I'll have this one for offensive, I'll, uh, you know, use this for this, and I'll use that for, like, between adventures to fix stuff or clean things. So, yeah. I mean, cantrips aren't anything to joke about anymore. I mean, they, they are kind of goofy little things, but, you know, your can, you, you can get a cantrip that's just as powerful as shooting, um, I don't know, a hand crossbow or you know, hitting someone with a sword, uh, a short sword, or, you know, and, and you and don't have to carry a, a weapon. That, that, but they may be changing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we come to Warlock. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. So, um, pretty much Warlock, I mean, you get your spells, you get your ability score improvements at 4th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th. You get some meta magic stuff here and there, um, your sorceress origin feature for whatever you choose. Uh, you get that at sixth and fourteenth level, and then at twentieth level you get sorceress restoration, which oh goodness, um, sorceress restoration. At twentieth level you regain four expanded sorcery points whenever you finish a short rest. So. You regain four expended sorcery points whenever you finish a short rest. That's yeah. I think they blew it on the name though. Yeah, I don't think they it's. They should a... call it Sorcerer uh, Sorcerer Supreme. Ooh, yeah, or Sorcerer Surprise. No, <laughs> but it doesn't seem as cool as the rogue ability to, uh, you know, just re-roll dice rolls. But hey, it's magic, so that's something for something. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything you want to talk about with sorcerers before we start talking about the warlock? No, I think we covered it. Okay. Warlocks. They're like sorcerers, but different. <laughs> yeah, and so warlocks came, and I think it was the complete arcana yep. or the complete magic in 3.0. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and I played one in 3.0, 3.5. And they're a lot different. I mean, yes, there was sort of the pack, but Warlocks had like college, like one of the books. It had a map of the Warlock College. Uh -huh. and, and now they've really stressed the pack. And that you're, you know, that you are not dealing with a deity. Mm -hmm. It's not as powerful as a deity, but you've got some sort of character. And of course, they've got a whole section that's basically. Lovecrafting creatures, sure, yeah, uh, celestial ones where you know there's a, a large tradition of religion where you don't necessarily approach deity, but you approach an angel or a saint. Yeah, you know, so so there's definitely I I, I love warlocks, mm -hmm. but I guess they're gonna get there's a good chance. And nothing of this official, and they're still working on it. Yeah. But um, I understand, and that they're, they're going to get a big rework in D and D one. Okay. Which is kind of like sixth edition. Yeah. And one of the things is that Eldritch Blast will just go back to a power. Okay. It won't be. I, I mean, and they can change. Nothing is official now. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're they're testing it. Okay. But Eldritch Blast will go to a power, more as opposed to a, a, a cantrip, 
and it'll be taken away from all the other classes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think that they're going to, and I liked, I liked them as third, uh, I mean, in 3.5. Mm-hmm. And to me, it just seemed like um, it was basically a um, a magic user that had a lot of, uh, oh, magic missiles, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really what it felt like with Warlock, or at least what I felt like people were using Warlock for. (laughs) And it it felt like Warlock could really have been expanded upon in 3.5, Pathfinder, whatever. And it's like, when I think you told me about how 5th edition, the Warlock was a lot cooler than it used to be. I was like thinking to myself, I don't know about that. Maybe Dave's wrong i'll I'll look into it and then i looked into it and i was like whoa i wish i would have known how cool warlocks were i would have chosen one <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the other thing is that that your your whoever you're making this pack with and it yeah. doesn't have to be demon it doesn't have to be cthulhu no you know I, we had one where it was a uh a uh a a gnome warlock who had made a power with like the most powerful unicorn in the realm yeah uh the unicorn's name was lolly pop uh, <laughs> so you know it wasn't so but you have a lot i think a lot more room for um you, know, you don't want your you don't want your patron to be an npc no but but it, you got a lot more room for customization yeah uh, kind of like, uh, you know, the Venture Brothers where Dr. Or- Orpheus, you know, goes to his master. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so I, 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 I like, I like Warlocks. Uh, I think that they may have gotten a little bit of, out of hand. That's why they need to bring them back in. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty cool, though. And they're really easy to learn. Uh, Warlocks start out with 1d8 per level for hit dice. Uh, Which is good. Yeah, they they also much like the uh, sorcerer, uh, simple weapons, uh, and when it comes to armor, they at least get light armor. So they have. I don't know. I feel I feel like a decent number of weapons to choose from. Quarterstaff probably being the best, and uh, they get two skills from. Uh, choose from from arcana deception history intimidation investigation nature and religion so again pretty close to sorcerer but still better <laughs> and, and, and i think i definitely think they're 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 probably the best magic users for new players yeah yeah and, including you could do with a celestial warlock if you know, a cleric is just, just sort of overwhelming. Sure, sure. And I also feel like maybe this is just me, but uh, the Warlock spell list for cantrips feels a little bit tougher, like a little bit like more robust than the uh, Sorcerer's um, uh, cantrips. Like the the Warlock may not be able to cast as many, but it's, it's like a, they're more powerful or something, but... That may just be my impression that I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Um, warlocks, they get uh, a patron and then pact magic. And then when they get to second level, they get eldritch invocations, um, which everyone gets eldritch invocations. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, who you're following. It's just called an eldritch invocation. Uh, you study occult lore, you have unearthed eldritch invocations, fragments of hidden knowledge that imbue you with an abiding magical ability. At second level, you gain two eldritch invocations of your choice. Your invocation options are as detailed at the end of the class description, so you can go check that out. Uh, I'm using 5esrd.com just because it has like all of the basic Wizards of the Coast and some third-party stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then at, uh, third level, you get Pact Boon, which is Pact of the Chain, Pact of the Blade, and Pact of the, um, Tome. And that's either a little buddy that you get that gets to follow you around, uh, a, a weapon that, uh, you know, 
turns into whatever weapon you need it to be. That's a melee weapon. Uh, and then, like, packed to the tome is uh, you're given a book called The Book of Shadows, and you uh, choose three cantrips from any class spell. Um, and uh, you can use those cantrips at well as long as the book is on your person. I don't remember what else is like. Uh, I think a long rest, and then you can use it again. But I, I, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, yeah. No uh, ability score improvements. Eighth, twelfth, sixteenth, nineteenth level. Um, let's see. At eleventh level, you get something called Mystic Arcanum, where your patron bestows upon you a secret called an Arcanum. Choose one at 6th level from your Warlock spell list, and you can cast your Arcanum spells once without expending a spell slot. Uh, you finish uh, Long Rest, and you can do it again. Uh, you get more at, I think, 13th? No. Uh, shoot, I can't remember. Look it up, it's in the Warlock Bard, everybody. And 20th level, you can draw upon your inner reserve of physical power while en uh, en entreating your... Uh, uh, huh. Entertaining? I don't know. Uh, that I can't re spell that word. Uh, your patron... Uh, you, you get your spell slots back. You can spend one minute, yeah. and you get your spell slots back. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, that's that's way better than you get four spell slots back and for, for a those short of rest. You that are, are using this podcast as part of your theses, yeah. Uh, for future, it, uh, Warlocks came up with a complete arcane uh, arcane that they first appeared in. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very true. That's very true. And. Um, also, I want to say that, uh, Warlocks have some pretty cool spells. They get spells, like, they get ninth level spells, which is something I'm pretty sure a sorcerer does not get. Or, what are that? Oh, shoot, now I gotta look up sorcerer again. Uh, no, no, they get, uh, they get one ninth level spell. And... What do those bojos get? Oh, you you get fifth level. Okay, all right. Um, you you have to do some crazy stuff to start getting stuff above fifth level spells. I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, anyway, yeah, it looks like sorcerers uh, go all the way. Anyway, um, look up the book. Don't use me as your. Uh, guide, even though this is the people's guide to the Cthulhu mythos. Uh, wizards are something that I really do want to talk about, and the fact that wizards have been around since, what, day one? Well, well yeah, so wizards are basically uh, the latest incarnation of the magic user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The original. Mage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, and I'm pretty sure at some t point in time in the past, their hit dice, starting hit dice, was 1d4. Yes. And now it's 1d6, which is kind of nice. Yeah. And uh, armor, none. They can use dagger, dart, slings, quarter staffs, and light crossbows. Um, they get to choose from arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine, and religion. And, uh, you know all the cool spells, you know, from Dungeons and Dragons that wizards get? They get yes. those spells all the way to ninth level. Um, yes. Yeah. S Spellcasting is kind of the thing that they're known for. At first level, they get their choice of cantrips, which they get to know three cantrips uh, from first level, and at 20th level, you know, five cantrips. Uh, you also get a wizard's list which has all of your fun spells on it. Um, let's see, what else do we got? And your spell book. Um, you can look into specifically what entails a spell book, unless, Dave, you, you know that off the top of your head by any chance. Um, not specifically, but, you know, it's always sort of like, it's almost like the equivalent of a, a holy symbol, if not game mechanic. Yeah. It's... it's you know, psychologically the same as, like, the holy symbol for 
um, you know, clerics. It's the way that the 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 wizard has learned how he's dedicated his life. Sure. Yeah. 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 And um, wizards get the spell casting ability, and also get, they get the ability to uh, do ritual casting, which a few others can do. I believe it's a feat, or sometimes it's a class feature. Um, you can also uh, use arcane focuses as a spell casting focus. And you can start learning spells uh, first level and higher. Uh, and as you go up in level, uh, you get to learn different level spells. At first level, you know some uh, first level spells, but you don't start learning second level spells until third level. You don't start learning third level spells till fifth level, fourth level uh, spells at seventh level, etc. And then at 17th level, you start to learn your first ninth level spells. Woohoo! So, yeah. Um, once per day, you can finish a short rest and choose uh, extended spells to recover. The spell slots uh, can be level combined equal to or less than half your wizard's level. Um, and none of either slots of 6th level or higher, and that's just called Arcane Recovery. So, for example, if you're a 4th level wizard, you can recover up to 2 levels worth of spell slots. You can recover either a 2nd level spell or 2 1st level spell slots. So that's pretty cool. 2nd yeah. uh, level, this is the fun one. You get to choose a tradition, whether it be abjuration, conjuration, divination, enchantment, evocation, illusion, necromancy, or transmutation. Woohoo! And I'm sure there's other types of mage types if you do third party stuff or dig up some like super old dragon magazines and convert it into fifth or something. But yeah. yeah. Uh, anything you have to say about uh, arc uh, arcane tradition there? Well, and I, and I think that, it, and again, I know that they did write a lot of this down, but a lot they didn't. But I think that the original makers, you know, way back in Lake Geneva, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, I, I think really Gandalf and Merlin were sort of their, you know, their, their inspiration for the class. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, Arcane Tradition... Uh, you get features for that at 2nd, 6th, 10th, and 14th level, depending on what it is. Uh, abilities score, of course, you get the 4th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th. Um, you know, bump a skill up by 2, or 2 separate ability scores by 1, or take a feat. Uh, spell Mastery. At level 18, you've achieved such mastery over certain spells that you can cast them at will choose a first level spell and a second level spell that are in your spell book you can cast those spells at their lowest level without expelling a expending a spell slot that uh, you've prepared so yeah that's that's a pretty cool and by spending eight hours in study you can exchange one or both of those spells and just kind of like switch it around and um, at 20th level you gain mastery over two powerful spells and can cast them with little effort. Choose two third-level spells from your wizard books for your uh, uh, signature spell. You can always have these spells prepared. They don't count against the number of spells that you have prepared. And you can cast each uh, of them at third level without expending a spell slot. When you do so, you don't gain or get more until a long rest. So, yeah, that's that's our uh, that's and, our. And they may wizards may be the most powerful. But yeah, th th there's gonna be a lot of number crunching if you're a brand new character. You may you may want to start with sorcerer or, or uh, warlock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I recommend most people start with something like sorcerer warlock. Uh, even a rogue might be a little bit too number crunchy for some people, and you know I will be like, hey, uh, what about a fighter? And yeah, and and then after that, it's like, well, your first person died. You understand the rules. What do you want to do now? And then they're like, oh, I like that one NPC who was a rogue. I think I want to do a rogue now. You know, I mean, um, your mileage may vary, and yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think that uh, I think that they we have well covered the classes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, yep, very, very true. Well, everyone, thank you again so much for joining us, uh, People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Uh, we're Dave and DB, and we're going to put in the end credits part here where we say all this stuff over and over again. But uh, Dave and I would like to thank you and wish you a good week. And if you're going to be in the Portland metro area on the 9th, 10th, or 11th of September 2022, look for me and Dave. We'll be around somewhere. And yeah, we'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Bye. That was a good episode. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Think everything, 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 everything. Bye. Bye. That was a good episode. And also remember, check the show notes, click those links, and find out how you can support the show. We've got a Patreon. We've got a direct link to PayPal. We've got sponsors that you can buy. Donner is having some really good deals right now. And also, I would have to say, check out Copper Cow Coffee. And uh, there's a Stone Ground Chocolate Company in there that you should check out called Taza. Uh, Stone Ground in Lovecraft Country. And... uh, Yeah, they've got some really good flavors. They don't use dairy. They use uh, vegetable-based milk instead, so Mm. it's vegan. Taz of Chocolates, Somerset, Massachusetts. Uh, We've also got stuff from Curvy Girl. We've got Golden Goat CBD gummies and uh, other stuff. Um, And, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a way to advertise on your website, on your podcast, whatever your projects are, your YouTube page. Uh, why not go to Share Sale? That's where I get all my sponsors from and pass the savings on to you. You can find that. You can advertise your projects. You can advertise your website, your products, any of that stuff. So check out the show notes and Dave and I will see you next time. Anything you want to say before we uh, head out into that night again? I said that before, but... uh, Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. All music by D.B. Spitzer. You're listening to KZOM, Oleander Public Radio.